I'm John Forsell. I look after the events program here at the library. And uh, pleased to introduce our next session in our Irish Writers Weekend, hosted together with Kurt International Festival of Literature. So t this next session is uh, uh, called Ireland's Island of the Imagination. And it's, of course, featuring Audrey McGee and Emma Donoghue. And the chair for tonight, or for this afternoon, is um, Claire Hutton, who we got to know very well earlier in this year when she gave a wonderful talk on women in Joyce's career and then hosted um, Anne Enright and Eamon McBride on a, another panel on Joyce um, as everybody was talking about um, the anniversary of Ulysses. Um, Claire is a reader of, uh, in English and Digital Humanities at Loughborough University and she curated an exhibition at the University of Texas in Austin earlier this year, Women and the Making of Joyce's Ulysses. And she's also um, author of Serial Encounters, Ulysses and the Little Review. But today she's not talking about Ulysses at all. And she is talking to Emma Donoghue and Audrey McGee. Thank you. And welcome to this session. Um, welcome to our in-person audience and to our audience online. Um, we're going to um, have the main session for about 45 minutes and then there'll be about 10 minutes for questions. It's a great pleasure indeed to um, introduce and think about um, these novels, um, Haven by Emma Donoghue and The Colony by Audrey McGee and indeed to introduce both novelists um, and let me begin by saying a little about both um, novelists. Uh, Emma is uh, prolific, <laughs> works across many genres. Uh, I think I've counted this correctly, 10 novels for adults thus far. Um, you can correct me. Um, <laughs> many uh, plays and short stories. Um, she's a graduate of UCD and Cambridge. She was born in Dublin in 1969 and now lives in Canada, except at the moment she's in Paris. Um, and Audrey, um, the Colony is her second novel after the undertaking in 2014. She's also a, t a UCD graduate. Um, before she uh, launched into the world of uh, published novel writing, she was a journalist for many years. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating to read both of your novels. Um, it felt to me, um, they gave me a very kind of palpable sense of shared past. It feels like we kind of all grew up in something of the kind of same um, community and world. Um, the colony takes us um, to Ireland in 1979. It's set on an island. Um, it's kind of geographically teasing. You kind of nearly tell us where it is, but not quite. I think that's deliberate. Um, and it's interwoven, this narrative about um, what's happening on the island, off the west of Ireland, is interwoven with a narrative about um, a, a, a fact-driven narrative about loyalist and republican atrocities. Um, so 1979, very vivid year in um, our recent past, reminded me just so very much of my own kind of childhood, events like the papal visit. The Haven um, reminded me of things like, you know, the class visit to Clonmacnoise, um, the slide from pagan traditions to Christianities, extreme faith, the way it breaks people, the manuscript tradition, the monastic tradition, um, a great deal of world building going on in um, both novels. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, both novelists to read and to maybe say um, something about the narrative of the book. Um, will I start with you, Emma? Is that sure, okay? Sure, sure. Would it mess up camera angles if we stand up? No. Sure. I find I'm a bit slumpy in this chair. It's more of a telewatching chair. Hello all, thank you very much for being here. And I'm so honored to be part of this um, Irish Writers Weekend London, which I assumed had been going on for 20 years without my hearing of it. But no, apparently first time. Um, and it has the classiest logo I've seen and um, the apostrophe in the right place. 
So I think, I think it bodes very well for the future. Well done so far. <laughs> so um, Haven is the uh, earliest set novel I've written. And it involved more um, months of going down internet rabbit holes um, in search of facts about what was the true shape of the tonsure an Irish monk would have been wearing in the year 600. It involved a lot of um, yeah, detailed research into things I knew nothing about. So um, I felt a bit as if I was you know, engrossed in a punitive, difficult, and um, protracted task, much like my monks. Um, it's, um, it starts in Clonmacnoise, where um, a, a stranger turns up, a very scholarly, um, famous priest who has you know, copied out dozens of books, and he chooses two, um, an old monk um, with a, a head broken by a slingshot and you know, amazingly saved through the surgical powers of early monks, um, Cormac, and he chooses a young one, an odd one, a left-handed one called uh, Trian who's mostly hungry all the time and is 19. And um, Father Art brings these two with him down the Shannon, looking for an island he's seen in a dream to make the ultimate, you know, pure monastic outpost. Because the paradox of early Irish Christianity is that they lived in tiny little isolated, hard, out of the way places, and they were constantly leaving them to find somewhere harder, <laughs> more isolated, <laughs> less, less in the way of beef or sheets, you know and more in the way of God and isolation. So um, this is a little bit where they've been literally drifting out to sea. They've shipped their oars. And they've literally been spinning around, um, hoping to spot an island that nobody's ever landed on before. And they're, they, they're um, you know, lost in the fog, basically. And this bit is narrated um, um, by Art, the, the middle one, the, the visionary. As young Trian is washing the holy vessels after mass and swaddling them in the chest, the glare of sun intensifies behind the fabric of cloud. The white fog thins, lightens, finally tears. At last, a spring breeze starts up. The boat slides broadside to it and lolls and rolls. Art, relieved to be moving even if only uncontrollably, watches the fog meandering off and leaving a sky only ribboned with cloud. Is that shock on young Trian's face? Art turns to look where the monk is staring. On the horizon to the southwest of them, two islands side by side thrust up from the sea. One larger, both weirdly pointed. What a pair of skellies! Trian marvels. Cormac skews around and shifts his bald head from side to side like a bird. He says, skellies? Spikes of rock in the sea, sheer sharp islands, I suppose our eyes must have been on the setting sun yesterday, Trian adds uncertainly, so we didn't look any further south. It's not that, says Art, and his voice comes out like a lion's roar. Christ is revealing them to us only now. Our island, the one for my dream, it must be one of those two. He makes a cross on his forehead, his mouth, his chest, and he sings out, if God is for us, who can be against us? Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find, knock and it will open. The monks chorus, Amen, catching his fervor. He watches the islands in a loud silence. His gaze eats up the distance. The boat rotates and drifts more or less in the right direction, but with a languor that racks Art's nerves. Young Trian must feel the same way because he begs, can we go faster, Father? The Sabbath, Cormac reminds him gruffly. Art stares up at the two great jagged outcroppings. The small pyramid floats beneath the level of the clouds. The broader, higher one rears up wrapped in vapor. It does seem ungrateful not to harness this little bit of heaven-sent wind. Well, he says, I, I don't suppose it would count as work to drop the sail at least. The other two rush to follow his lead, unfurling the great square and straining it to the sides of the hull. A light puff fills it at once and speed th speeds them south, just where they want to go. Closer, the great shards of grey are dabbed with green, as if a pair of mountains slid off the land into the sea and sailed away. Like some desert mirage, a miracle worked on a floating altar. Little by little, the two skelligs grow. Their crazed cones seem to art to be merging. The lesser slipping in front of the greater, the two becoming one. He wonders aloud, could there be snow on their tops? 
well past Easter, so surely not unless these unique rocks have their own rarefied weather. And Trian says, bird droppings more like. Ah, yes. With misgiving, Art jerks around to reckon how far these extraordinary islands lie from the mainland. Seven miles, eight, no more. Will they have been claimed by impure folk long ago? I see no signs of settlement yet. Nor I, father. The young man's voice is shrill with excitement. Maybe they're uninhabitable, says Cormac, and Art glares at him. I only mean they seem all up and down, but my eyes aren't what they were, the old monk admits. It strikes Art that the combination of the light current and the breeze is going to take their little boat right past the Skelligs too far south. He grabs the steering oar and pushes it deep into the water just to nudge the boat west. He wouldn't call this Sabbath-breaking work. He's only sitting, he's only holding on and feeling the pulse of the sea, his gaze on the island's splintery silhouettes. His throat is locked as the boat inches nearer the smaller island and the greater one looms behind it. They are like nothing he has ever encountered in all his travels. They're like two broken fists of rock held up in prayer. He sings out, be before me, O Lord, and the others chant back, as a bright flame. Be above me, O Lord, as a fixed star. Be below me, O Lord, and Cormac and Trian finish, as a clear path. As they approach what Art is already thinking of as the lesser Skellig, it reveals itself as entirely possessed by an army of birds. He can't hear anything like a hymn of praise in the screams of these vermin, nor can he see any spot where the monks could moor around the whole stained crag. Could it be too steep to land on? The boat is past the small island already, gliding slowly straight towards the bigger one, which is still a mile or two off. Its rough cone is veiled in cloud, but the breeze is already beginning to wipe it clean. And now the great skellig is revealed in all its strange glory, twice the height of its neighbour, sharply fingering the sky. Eroded by wind and water, he can see, littered with rockfall, smeared with emerald vegetation, its crags are capped with the droppings of the wheeling flocks who keep up their harsh cacophony. Oh, this is the place, Art proclaims. The higher up, the closer we'll be to heaven. On this island's peaks, our prayers will be halfway to God's ears already. Amen, Father, say the other two. The great Skellig is an abandoned fortress, awful in majesty. No, Art tells himself, it's not abandoned, it's just lonely, waiting for its commander. It's the most gigantic of cathedrals, ready for its priest. Thanks very much. It's just such a vivid imagination of place. You've really, really worked so hard to give a sense of the seventh century and that tradition and psychology and mindset. Um, and of course, it's a real place. Um, I want to move on now to um, a reading from the colony. And this, I think, is a fictional space. So. I might stand too. Um. Hi, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be here at this inaugural festival. And I hope there are going to be many more because I think it's an ingenious idea. Um, so, yeah. Here's to the future. Um, the Colony, um, as has been said, is my second novel. And it's the second part of a triptych I'm writing on power and the ordinary person. And in my first novel, The Undertaking, I explore um, what it was like to be an ordinary German during the Second World War. And here I explore so in the first novel, I'm, I'm exploring the, the concept of, of fascism and the ordinary person. In this, in this novel called The Colony, I'm looking at colonization and the ordinary person, and basically colonization and us. And what, what does it mean to be colonized? What does it mean to be the colonizer? And to do that, I thought the really the best place to go was to, to an imagined island off the west coast of Ireland where I could take everybody and distill all these things that I wanted to think about, all these things that I wanted to explore, all these legacies of colonization that we inherit and we don't even realize we're inheriting. 
um, that we inherit as the colonized and that we inherit as the colonizer and that, that we use still in our interactions with each other. And, and I, I try on this tiny, tiny imagined island to unpick those habits, to unpick those legacies so that we can just maybe clear a space in our, in our dialogue and in the way we interact with each other. Um, and to do that, obviously, I, I've, I've made some little characters to take to my island. Um, I've, I, I, the novel opens with a, um, an English painter called Mr. Lloyd. We only know him as Mr. Lloyd. And he decides that he is going to have a very authentic experience um, and take a curragh to an Irish island. And the novel opens with him stepping into the curragh, certain that he knows what he's going to, certain that he knows what he's doing, very, just a very certain character as he goes off to this Irish-speaking island. Um, and he goes to paint, he wants to paint the cliffs and pledges that he won't paint the people, but then begins to annoy the, the islanders because he then breaches his promises and paints them and starts to create a little bit of tension. But that tension increases when a little later on in the summer, it's the summer of 1979, and a little later on in that summer, uh, Jean-Pierre Masson, a Frenchman, comes onto the island. And Monsieur Masson, known as Jean-Pierre, um, or JP by the islanders, has been going to this island for, for, this is his fifth summer on the island because he's doing this longitudinal study on the demise of the Irish language and the, and the influence of English on this island and on this island community. And he is horrified to find an Englishman on the island because it will destroy his study and it will hasten the demise of the language that he thinks needs to be protected and he is fighting to protect. And he has his own interpretation of how the, of how the islanders should live. Mr. Lloyd has his own interpretation of the islanders and how they should live. Meanwhile, you have the islanders trying to live as they might want to live. Um, and that's, that's principally based around um, four generations of the, of the islanders who, whose language is being traced by Masson. And those islanders are Banny Flynn, who is kind of like a peg-like character, if anybody did peg. I will now confess to having been a closet peg lover when I was in school, I thought she was amazing. So I pay tribute to her in this novel by creating a kind of a, a peg character. Um, so she's, if you like, the overall matriarch of this family. And then it's her daughter who's Banny Neal, and then her, her daughter in turn, who's Maraid, and Maraid is a beautiful young widow woman on the island. She has lost her husband and her father and her brother in a single boating accident and now lives with James, her son. And James is the only member of the family who is bilingual. Um, the others have either a, a latent understanding of English or in Banny Flynn's case, an absolute refusal to speak English because she is the protector of tradition and the protector of the language. So in this little section I'm going to read, it's Maraid, um, who I must say, I didn't expect Maraid to turn up when I started to write. She just kind of appeared and um, yeah, I think she and I have become lifelong friends. So I'll read now from Maraid. He left. She washed the plates and cutlery and stoked the fire. She sat down and lifted the charcoal grey knitting from the basket at the side of the chair. The start of a jumper for James, dark to hide the dirt. She stretched the knitting across her lap and counted. Eight rows done, two to go, one row plain, one row pearl. Ready in time for school, James, if you ever go back back to those priests and their ways. She started to knit, sliding one needle over the other and looping the wool. They're quietening of you, James. They're stilling of you, and your nails chewed the quick. She finished the cuff at the base of the jumper and added six extra stitches to each side. She knitted on, rows of plain and pearl to build the foundations of the pattern to come, her own pattern her design, as she knitted it for Liam, 
Now for James, who tells me nothing, insists only that I shouldn't worry, that they don't like me because I'm an island boy. But don't worry, ma'am, because I don't like them either. She counted the stitches. 134. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. The knitter's prayer. She continued. Three more rows. Plain, pearl, plain. She stretched the knitting across her thighs, counted the stitches one more time and started on her pattern. Blackberry stitch, cable, moss. Diamond up the middle and out the other side in reverse. Moss, cable, blackberry. She knitted the first blackberry, building three stitches from one, gathering them, wrapping them in pearl and pushing through the birth of a berry to texture the jumper. She smiled and stroked the woolen knot. A thickening of the wool to keep James warm, as it warmed me, knitted by my mother. Though not my grandmother, who still calls this the English knitting, the English scheme, their guilt for the famine, for the land theft. They take our land, she says, starve us, and then to alleviate the poverty, to assuage their guilt, they set us up with knitting. Make jumpers this way, they said, and sell them, they said. Earn your living that way, they said. Earn your rent that way, they said. Though we liked earning our living the other way, from the land that was our land, the sea that was our sea. But they told us to knit. So now we knit. Well, I'm not knitting, says Banny Flynn. Not that knitting. Their knitting, their Scottish, English, Irish knitting. I'll do my own knitting. Knit as my mother did, as my grandmother knitted. Mairead laughed at Banny Flynn sitting up there still by the fire with her pipe, her tea and her knitting. Defiant, making socks that nobody wants to wear anymore. Socks with patterns more intricate than these jumpers. Socks of waves and weaves, twists and turns. Socks that sit in a drawer because my father, her daughter's husband, was the last islander to wear them. Dozens of socks in that drawer waiting for him to come back from the sea. Mairead smiled. At least his feet won't be cold when he comes back from the sea and opens that drawer of socks. She knitted on. Twenty plain stitches, the foundation of the cable that would run up the side of James's chest, from his hip bones to his clavicle. Then the moss stitch, plain, pearl, plain, pearl. The knitting soothing in the stillness of the sleeping house, the sleeping village her metal needles sliding one over the other to build the base of the diamond pattern that would run up the centre of the jumper along James's chest. Still skinny, though his voice is broken and he is shaved once or twice, his chin only. Surreptitiously, the hair is washed away, the blade hidden, his father's blade without his father's guidance, without the guidance of a man. For the priests are of no use to him, those men in frocks, and he has no time for me, Hall, even less for Francis, his own uncle. Though he likes the Englishman well enough. Maybe he talks to the Englishman as he would have talked to his father. A man of little use to him now under the sea in one of these jumpers. Dark like this one. A bed now for fish, a blanket for crabs. The wool more enduring than his skin and flesh. Than his black, black hair. But what of your bones, Liam? The marrow of your bones, of you. What is left of them, of you, my love? Down there, underneath, in the sea grave, the grave sea. Is anything left, or are you all gone? Eaten, atomized, diluted, and dispersed. Carried from one ocean to the next, Tiny particles of you travelling around the earth. My husband in Australia, in Africa, in South America. Travelling the world without me, though you promised that we would go together, leave together, the three of us. But you left without me, Liam. Without us. She sipped at her tea and knitted on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to both um, our readers. Um, so, 
just to bring these two, in some sense, the novels are quite different. And in another way, they have this unity, which is they're both set on islands. And in a way, the question I'd like to ask is about why islands are so fascinating. And of course, this has quite a long history. And I was thinking a bit about Yeats and Singh. Yeats famously gave um, Singh advice in 1896 when they met in Paris. Um, and he says, um, he said, he, he, in Yeats's account of this famous story, he says, give up Paris, go to the Aran Islands, live there as if you were one of the people themselves, express a life that has never found expression. And it's that last bit that I think is fascinating, this idea of expressing that in a way, digging into the stories about island life, that you are, it facilitates this express a life that has never found expression. I just wondered if you could open up on that and talk a bit about what inspires and motivates this writing about an island specifically. I suppose there are a lot of good reasons why you would set a book on an island, you know, much like, say, the, I'm thinking of genres like the, the locked room, murder mystery, or the yeah. country house. There are lots of sort of practical reasons. But what's different from that is when you're trying to explore the specific culture of an island. Yeah. And um, I suppose in my case, yes, it all began by, you know, I've never been on Skellig Michael and because of COVID, um, my trip there was cancelled, but I, I've been on a boat around it, so tantalizingly close. <laughs> so when going around it in the little boat, I was looking up at the staircases, multiple staircases the monks cut. Uh, there's a, there's a, rich, a richness of staircases, as if they had all the time in the world to fill. You know, over centuries, they cut these steps by hand. And I remember thinking, when did they build the staircases? You know, at what point? Because it would have been handy to have them on day one for <laughs> lugging your barrels up the mountain. But it couldn't have been top priority if you were trying to find fresh water and catch some fish. So I was tormented by the kind of logistics of it. You know, at what point would you say, stop everything, lads, cut a staircase, it'll help us with the next task. And then I thought, these men weren't motivated by practical survivalism anyway, yeah. because their, their whole enterprise was so perverse. They were going there to suffer, they were going there to pray, um, they were going there to copy books for people who weren't there to read them. So the whole thing was, was a kind of absurdist um, exercise more than a survivalist one. So, so yes, I, I, I wrote Haven to answer the question of what on earth might their life there have been like, yeah. yes. Um, clearly it's a, it's a community that could never have expressed itself you know, directly to us in memoir and so on because they were going there to sort of shed their filthy selves and live more purely. So they would never have you know, done some sixth century equivalent of given an interview or blog, you know. <laughs> they would have been like, shush, we have work to do. Um, so so I, I took on the kind of impossible task of wondering what it might possibly have been like for them, yeah. And the book is entirely successful in that, in terms of giving you a deeply and kind of vivid sense of the kind of psychology and lived experience of being on Skellig Michael. I mean, it kind of makes you want... It certainly made me want to go. It's a place I've always wanted to go to. But um, to think that, yes, people went in you know this era so before our kind of modern conveniences and the toil and difficulty of actually doing it that's so vividly imagined in the book um, so maybe i should move the the island question to audrey what do you think yeah i mean I, I, islands are fascinating i mean we're all on an island right now we're on an island <laughs> you know um but but to do what i wanted to do which was this exploration of colonization, I had to take us into, into an even smaller space and into an even smaller island. Yeah. Um, because I suppose when you, when, you, when you cut away all the superfluous things that can happen in, in kind of more urban areas or whatever, I think one of the things that attract us to islands, islands attract painters, musicians, writers, you know, for generations now, we've all been attracted to these spaces because they're really so elemental. You know, it's obviously the seventh century was incredibly elemental, but even still, you know, you're so exposed to even the weather. Um, so when you, when you go to an island, you're, you're accepting that you're living at a different pace. So in the novel, I, I kind of almost have to, it's like we, the reader and all of us, we have to go on a trip to the island to create a space where we can explore 
this, these concepts and these legacies. Um, and, and I think it, you know, the, I suppose I was following the tradition of this artist going to an island, and that was probably, I, I did it myself when I was in journalism. I was working with the Times, the London Times, and I went up with um, Derek Hill, who's an English artist who used to go every summer to Tory Island. And he used to go and paint the cliffs and paint sometimes the people on the island. Um, and I was actually probably about seven months pregnant when I did this trip. Um, so I do remember the nausea of the boat trip. Um, and it, I, was, I was fascinated by his desire to be so removed to create and to create a space for creation. And, and in a way, I, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to create a space for creation that would allow me to ask, if you like, questions about being, the being of being, that kind of Heidegger, Dasein, the being of being. Um, what, is, what, is our, what is the essence of our being now in the wake of colonization? Um, what happened? What is that legacy? And, and I found I just had to go into a very small space to create almost like a, a German kind of Kammerspiel, like a, a theater piece. Um, where there were very few people and but very big issues and it allows you to distill and distill and distill until you're getting to an essential space. Fantastic, thank you. I mean, one of the things that both the novels do is negotiate around this question of um, the Irish language and one of the things you negotiate, both of you, very well is you know, writing in English as though we, you know, the, the, the reader needs to imagine that actually all of this is being um, transacted off Gaelga. And that's a difficult thing to do. And again, there's a tradition of doing that. And that, I mean, technically, you handled it in quite difficult ways and different ways in the sense that your um, novel is kind of macaronic. There's quite a lot of Irish thrown in. None of it terribly difficult. I thought that was interesting because I, I don't have much Irish. I left Ireland when I was 15, so I was at a fairly basic level. But I, I didn't have to look anything up. It was all, it was all implied. Um, I don't think there's any Irish in your text. I think there's maybe just... Uh, just, just the odd name or maybe the word Kyathog, yeah, for which there was no exact translation. Yeah. Yes, the first time I've ever written English standing in for another language, I was hugely self-conscious about it to start yes. with. But then I found it quite liberating because once you're doing that translation anyway, you then don't have to sound old timey. No. And in particular, yeah. I didn't need to sound kind of medieval like maybe from the 1300s, because that wasn't going to give the flavor of the yeah. year 600 anyway. So I could afford to have them speak a fairly, I think of it as Hilary Mantel speak as an homage to her. You know, she, she is a way of, of choosing sentences that are mostly monosyllables, and they are words that Thomas Cromwell could have spoken and we could have spoken. She finds, yeah. she finds yeah. words that work for both eras. It's almost like a kind of direct tunnel mm. to uh, Tudor times. And similarly, I tried to go for sentences that would feel kind of plain and bare bonesy, mm. that would somehow maybe give the flavor of the mindset of the year 600, but without any kind of faux medievalism. And yeah, once, once I'd permitted myself to do that, um, I actually found it very liberating not to have to stick within the idiom of, say, when I've written things set in 18th century English, there are far more difficult decisions yeah. about which words you allow yourself. But once you're writing a translated language anyway, you just sort of go for it. Yeah. Certainly, it didn't come across. There was any, like the, the, the medieval elements of the book is just kind of completely convincing. It didn't feel, f yeah, I can see exactly the problem you were trying to get around, that kind of faux medievalism issue. And I can see how the, it was linguistically liberating to do what you did. I have another question, which I want to just focus in a bit on religion. Um, and in a way, if, if you had to stand back from the, from the novel, having kind of obviously lived that kind of very vivid, descriptive detail, pulling it all together, making the story rounded, is in a way is, is one of the big points in the in the novel that it's kind of pointing to the extreme kind of psychology that organized religion creates or can create. I mean, is that one of the kind of take homes? Do you think? Yes, but I really tried to to balance it by, you know, showing 
what an incredible motivator their faith was as well. Yeah. I mean, it literally drives the plot. It gets these men from, you know, a monastery in which they're kind of subsumed in the group. It plucks them out. It sends them down the Shannon, past danger, out to sea. In a way, it, it turns them into the artist who comes up with a mad plan. There's no particular need for a new novel in the world, and yet you have this mad plan. You have to go home and write a novel. And similarly, I feel religion is a huge drive and source of kind of energy and ambition and, and creativity in the novel, as well as the more obvious bad sides. And so for every time when I was giving Father Art a kind of a mad megalomaniac moment, mm. you know, or a colonizer moment, frankly, because even though there are no human inhabitants, his approach to the birds is very much like kill the natives, you know? Yeah. Um, but I tried to balance that with many moments where, say, young Trian has a kind of a proto Francis of Assisi moment where he's like, oh, the birds are my sister, the moon is my mother, you know? So I, I tried to find as much beauty in the, the early Christian tradition as there is, um, you know, um, fascism and, you know, brutal um, asceticism and, and um, yeah, what's the word? I don't want to start listing all the bad things about it. <laughs> I, guess. I try to find the good as well as the bad. Absolutely. But in the end, I, I, I'm worried about spoilers. I don't know about, but when Trian's identity is kind of revealed towards the end, or a more complicated kind of twist in the plot right at the end. That's very interesting because in, in the end, I think then the moral judgment at the end of art is pretty conclusive. There's a judgment of art, but Cormac, by quoting a different bit of the Bible, is able to find a way to fully accept and love the young man. So you can find anything yeah. you like in the Bible. So I really tried to show yeah. early Irish Christianity is a very varied tradition. You know, there are, you know, I was using a lot of saint stories, stories about the saints, and I would find one that, like the famous one, Seamus Heaney wrote a poem about, you know, St. Kevin allowing the bird to nest in his hand. Mm -hmm. And then there are other stories where um, saints curse birds or freeze them and roast them for dinner, you know, so, so you, can find, you can find the opposites um, very easily. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question before we just move on um, to open it out to the audience. I, I thought maybe I'd ask Audrey about um, the implications of the kind of narrative interweave. And maybe I've just explained that the, the book has, um, so the colony has quite long um, descriptive fictional chapters, um, which are set on the um, island where there's just a handful of characters. It's really at the, um, uh, about seven or eight characters in total, mainly focused on Lloyd, the artist, and on um, J.P. Masson, the linguist. That's one of the major narratives. The other narrative is a kind of reportage telling us over the summer of 1979 of a kind of series of quite um, dramatic Republican and loyalist atrocities which played out. Um, some of which are very vivid. I was a child at the time, and some of them, I really do remember those things happening. And I, I just think I'm fascinated by the implications of the duality of what your novel is doing. And asking really, in the end, is it a parable about nationalism and what nationalism or colonialism does yeah, to people? I mean, you know, I. Yeah, I was 13 in 1979, um, and it was a very important summer in my life, and it's, it's interesting that we're all kind of having similar relationships with 1979. But I was 13 in, in 1979, I went to France um, uh, on a French, I went to stay with a French family, and I, they, it was kind of at the, near the, you know, at the beach in, um, in Brittany. And we'd spend the morning working in a kitchen, and then we'd spend the afternoon kind of hanging out and hanging out on the beach and playing with boats. And there were boys there playing with boats, and it was all a very just such a mellow. That was the month of June. Those the people I stayed with had no no English, and I had no French, so I had to learn French. And it was just a really a huge summer for me, a huge month for me. And then I came back and. You know, the summer was doing its usual thing in Ireland, um, but there was this drumbeat of of kind of a lot of kind of tension around the place um, that that really exploded in that day in, in, 
in, in August, on August 27th, um, when um, the IRA bombed Mountbatten's boat. Now, obviously, there would have been an awful lot of violence happening up in Northern Ireland, but this crossed the border into the south. Mm. And it killed the, the, the bomb killed Mountbatten, and it killed an 82-year-old woman um, who was the mother-in-law of his daughter. But it also killed two young boys, um, one of them Mountbatten's grandchildren, and then the other, a young boy working on the boat. That for me was seismic because I had been in France, I was 13, they were 14 and 15, other 14 and 15 year old boys in France were playing on boats and nobody was getting killed. And it was quite, even though I was very young, it was a very kind of existential moment for me where I just realized um, that being Irish had a different identity to being France, to being French. And that continued when I traveled. And I remember as an 18 year old going to, to Denmark and the pride they had and the flag and the Danish flag would be flying, you know, all over the place and people would have it in their houses. And I'm like, wow, it was just, it was just a really a huge disconnect for me because we had so many issues with identifying with flag, with identifying with language, with identifying with, um, just with this legacy of violence and th what it meant and how it identifies you as, as, as a teenager. And I mean, that's where you were asking earlier about language. The, the book explores the legacy of colonization, obviously, but the legacy too of this, this violence that was the backdrop to our lives, people of my generation, who would grow up with this, this violence kind of puncturing into our lives. We were safe in the South, so it's very much a Southern perspective. It's, I don't at all claim, claim at all in any way to be writing a Northern experience. It's very much a Southern ex perspective, which is why also we have the distance of the island, because we're, we're away from it, but it still cuts into the narrative on what's happening on this remote island. It still cuts into our, the daily life. And, it's, it's cutting into what's happening on the island, firstly at a kind of a remove, but then it, when it starts to become about young boys being at risk, the, the, the island women start to become a little bit worried and anxious about James, because suddenly James is in that category too. So what, you know, suddenly James is at risk, what's gonna happen with James? Um, so we all kind of, even though we're at a distance and even though we tried to, you know, it, ignore it growing up and our parents tried to ignore it for us growing up because it was over the border it just for me as a child it didn't seem to quite stay over the border i don't know why mm. but i ended up as a reporter spending a huge amount of time in northern ireland i ended up covering the oma bomb and it was really the oma bomb that i suppose i really realized i journalism wasn't enough for me anymore i needed to go deeper i needed mm. to try and understand this at the core of much of my work is trying to reason with violence, Hannah Arendt's The Banality of Evil, trying to understand violence, the hierarchy of violence, why we resort all the time to violence as a tool, as a weapon, until it, you write about puffins in your work, um, in, in my work, there's, there's just this kind of hierarchy of violence where it, it goes right down through the entire society until it, it ends up on this tiny little baby puffin. And it's so interesting in both our works, the birds really do take the brunt of a lot of the, this, mm. this human violence. Um, so it's definitely, I think, a, a space we both end up in, which I think is really interesting, you know, that, um, that the, we both, I think, see that the birds are really the core inhabitants of these islands, um, and yet the violence ends up on them. So, yeah. In you a sense, one nationalism. of the um, sorry, yeah. but, but I think it is it is a struggle to try. It is definitely it's 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 a question of it's a search for an understanding of identity. It's it's, it's a search for understanding when you grow up in a in a post. I don't even know what your island is post colonial in in the context of Brexit. But anyway, let's let's use these these phrases of post colonial, colonial, whatever. Um, but but what does that do to you, um, what does that, yeah, it's definitely a trying to understand and, and how do you reclaim your flag, you know, how do you reclaim your language? Uh, certainly I, I 
I'm a, naturally a linguist, I study language, I could wander around Europe, speak French, German, Dutch, Romanian, Italian, Spanish, not a bother, but I couldn't speak Irish. You know, and, and it was like, well, why don't I speak Irish? So what, what's, the, what's the baggage of that that I don't mm. speak Irish? Like, what, where, what is that? Like, why, you know, they, every other language comes incredibly naturally to me, so why, why not it? So it, it's, I don't have the answers, but I'm just like digging, you know? Um, so, yeah. So it's very interesting. It seems to me that one of the, the bridges between both books is in a way a kind of... Um, insistence on the specifics of cultural memory and of kind of recognizing and coming to terms with kind of deeper aspects of a kind of collective past and seeking to really understand and kind of interrogate, you know, how that shapes our presence. Because I think there's another similarity with our book books, because I think we're both on islands, obviously. And, and you know, if you think of colon, col the colony in Ireland, you think of, of, of English colonization, but as soon as we became independent, we created a constitution, we, we built a hospital and education system. Obviously, we were very poor, we sought help, but the help we sought was from the Vatican with incredible consequences, particularly for, for um, Irish people who didn't quite fit into the, you know, the perfect Catholic framework. So, you know, I, I think we're this is again where our novels do marry, that we, we are exploring the issues of the impact of, of, of religion, of the impact of political yeah. structures, you know, that... that, yes. that um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think on that note, we should probably um, open up to questions. Um, so I can see two microphones, no, one at the back there and one at the back here. So if you'd like to raise your hand, if you'd like to ask questions. Um, There's a lady there. Have we got any? Yeah, we've got one over here. Hi, I was just wondering um, if you had any trouble like reconciling writing about colonization or like a colonizing experience in when like when talking about the Irish language, writing about that in English. Did you have any trouble reconciling that? I think it's a fascinating, it's a really strong question. Um, are you an Irish writer if you don't write in Irish? I mean, it's it's huge. It's it's. Um, it's, and it was a very interesting space to, to use the Irish language in my work because I don't have Irish, you know, I don't, I mean, I have school Irish, but, you know, I have, I have these lines of, of, of assistance and the, my first assistance was my children who had just, who had been to the Gale Talk more recently than I had um, and who had done Irish and, and then, then I went to the, to the universities to get help there. But then in the end, I had to find an Irish um, that wasn't an island Irish because I was very keen that it wasn't labelled as any particular island because it's a metaphorical space of the island of Ireland. So I ended up using actually an Irish, an Irish dialect from, from the mainland, um, from a, a part of northwest Mayo. And it's a dialect now spoken only by 160 people. Um, so I, I completely really think it's a very interesting question for for writing you know when we write in the english language and which is the language that we um now mainly use in in, in ireland and this is the language of the people of the colonizing country um, and this is a question that's being dealt with in africa and french you know if you if you are in fr um, francophone africa should you be writing in french should you be writing in in the regional languages what do, what do you do what do you how do you so I feel I've preserved a little bit of the Ducreach on Irish, um, but I, I don't know. I I don't know whether I'll seek to delve further into the Irish language. I don't know what I'll do next. But it's um, it's a very interesting concept in terms of what what language you use. And I was just on a, a tour of Southeast Asia with with the novel, and one of the things we kept talking about was was language. One of the things we talk in Indonesia, all these tiny languages, all these tiny islands, each of them with their own language or dialect, um, but mainly actually language. And 
what do they do? Do they write in Indonesian? Do they write in that language? In their local languages like Batak? What do they do? It's, a, it's an international discussion. Um, and it's, it's also a European discussion, but it's, it's, it's absolutely international. Yeah. I mean, Yeats was quite good on this question about language, nationalism, and identity. You know, he says, um, one of his kind of pithy, kind of almost kind of aphorisms, he said, um, Irish is my national language, it is not my mother tongue. You know? uh, and, and you look at Joyce, and you look at Beckett, and the, yeah. the, 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 the debates they had within themselves. I mean, Joyce, when he was a student, you, you know this, but when Joyce was a student, he, he decided he was going to learn Irish and then just couldn't actually abide to the whole kind of nationalist fervor, the national movement. And, you know, in, um, in, in, in um, Stephen Hero, he, you know, declares English is the language of the continent and I'm off and off he went. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then Beckett, you know, found freedom from this whole question by writing in French and then wrote in English when he decided that that was now a foreign tongue to him. Yeah because he had distanced himself sufficiently. So, you know, this is an age-old discussion that we have in writing, and, and as we should have in writing, because language is what we do. So, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a new generation. It's a really interesting... I don't know how much more time I could, I could take. But, you know, it's a really... It's a, such an interesting space now within the Irish language in Ireland in terms of what's happening. Will I talk yeah. about that? Um, because basically now the, the, the west of Ireland, where, which is the core and the ancient language and the language linked to land and the language linked to heritage and the language linked to ancestry, that's spoken now. As I said, the Dukhekon dialect is 160 people. There are now actually more speakers on the east coast of Ireland numerically than there are on the west coast. And those principally those speakers on the East Coast are second language learners in that they have learnt it from a, maybe from an Irish, an Irish um, teacher, you know, an, an originally West of Ireland teacher, or maybe themselves, those teachers themselves are second language learners. So it's a new kind of Irish, but it's incredibly vibrant on the East Coast, and it's whether you, mm. there's some way to blend the East and West, you know, that's a, yeah. another debate. Right. So. Um, have we got any other questions? I think there's one there, yeah. Thank you. Um, I haven't read either of these books, The Haven and The Colony, but I'm definitely going to read them at Christmas. They're absolutely fascinating, and there's an enormous parity between them. Somehow they're sort of similar, not just by the islands, but so few people and such large issues. I think that's what Audrey said. And the question I have is really to Emma. Um, I haven't read The Haven, but I have seen The Wonder. And that's the screenplay that I think you've been associated with. And I wonder whether, sorry, can you hear me? I wonder whether the monks, found what they were looking for on the island, on Skellig. Is it about spirituality? Is it about futility? Is it in the end about transience, something that is for then and then is dead and gone? A bit like in The Wonder, where you have enormous religious fervor, but in the end, it's futile. Um, I wonder if you could tell us anything about that. Sure. I mean, without going into much detail, it's, it's just, it's an odd accident of timing that a novel I published in 2016 has just turned into a film on Netflix. And my newest novel, they both appear to show that I have some kind of obsession with or perhaps grudge against <laughs> <laughs> extreme Christianity. And I swear I've written about many things in between and before and after, but these two just seem to have come out like a double whammy this autumn. Uh, and they are similar, I suppose, in that even though The Wonder is set in um, 19, uh, sorry, 1859 um, Irish Midlands and Haven in the year 600 on Skelligs, um, they both feature extreme commitment to, to religion in, in a way which is very ascetic and um, embracing of pain, embracing of hunger, embracing of suffering, but also ecstatic and uh, visionary and meditative. Um, and in both cases, I suppose I've tried to show 
you know, some of the, the, the sweetness of that tradition and the astonishing sense of meaning it would have given to your life, especially if you're a nobody. You know, if you're some left-handed boy orphan, um, or if you're some, you know, 19th century Irish child who will never have a vote, unlikely to have a job, unlikely even to get married. Um, you know, the, these nobodies, by, by clinging to the um, narrative of, of saintliness, could find their lives suddenly buoyed up by meaning, you know? I mean, remembering my childhood, you know, the idea that if you had a, a you know, a sty on your lip or something, um, I now can't remember, do you only have styes on your eyes? Anyway, some weird little facial imperfection. But if you were told to offer it up, that suggested that you were like doing something impressive by having this nasty spot, you know? I mean, what other traditions can, can rival that? I say, you know, meaning in every pimple, you know? <laughs> so you might say it's a perverse tradition to say to a child who is suffering in some small way, you know, Jesus wants your pain. But on the other hand, <laughs> it packaged your pain in a way that made you feel like I'm having this, this die for Jesus. So, so I think it's a hugely um, energizing and meaningful storyline to grab hold of. So this is why, yes, I suppose I've been interested in several different stories about what it might be like to, to kind of jump on that boat and see where it carries you. I've never jumped on the boat of extreme religion myself. I'm very moderate. But I like these characters who, 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 take, the, who take the journey all the way to the end. Yeah. So um, on the issue of taking the journey all the way to the end, I'm aware of time. And I've <laughs> chosen little um, excerpts from both the books just to kind of read us out, if that's OK. So I'm going to. Um, crave your permission just to read a tiny little detail from each novel just to finish us out. Um, in the end, if you set a novel on an island, um, you've got a kind of unity of place and a kind of crisis plot which is going to resolve in some way. And one of the things that happens is that, you know, some people leave the island and some people are left behind. And I'm drawn to the characters who are left behind and what sort of altered psychology is in the situation then at the end. Um, so I'm going to begin with um, the colony and with Maraid. What is it about, you know, um, Maraid who is this, you know, mother figure, widowed, relatively young, attractive, left behind, Lloyd has gone, Masson will go. Um, but the thing that's happened to her is she's been painted by Lloyd. And there's a beautiful moment where um, she is posing um, as a model for Lloyd and she, she realizes that she's been seen in a way which she regards as quite, in a way which is quite true and as, as she's being painted, she says, I want him to unearth it, this thing, this thing that is me, beyond the beauty that everybody sees, beyond that, beyond too what Mam sees, what James sees, what Francis sees, what JP sees, what JP thinks it see, he sees. The truth of me, as I was then, I want that unearthed, captured and taken away far from here. So, and that is exactly what happens, that she's painted in this large canvas painting, and it leaves on the boat to go back to London. So that is a conclusion of a kind for Maraid. Um, Art is left behind on Skellig Michael, the, the lone monk, the other two have left on the boat. Um, in the book, uh, one of the things that's very vivid to me is where you um, write about you know, the kind of illuminating and illuminated manuscripts tradition. And you talk in some detail about the making of the book, the making of a manuscript, and you said there is no end to the making of books. Um, and I think that's fascinating to, to see a writer writing about the act of making a book. Um, and that's where I wanted to end up and really to say thank you to both novelists for writing these wonderful novels. And just, I'll, I'll finish with this little bit here. His left palm, so she's writing about the act of writing. His left palm cramps and his flexed wrist aches. His right hand feels bruised where he grips the knife handle too hard. Three fingers write, the saying goes, two eyes read, one tongue speaks, the whole body toils. I'd like to say thank you to both novelists for toiling 
and writing these novels with such grace and energy. Thank you. Thank you.